By the way, if you're uh, watching this, don't click the Google Meet link. You got to click the other link. I just emailed it. I just emailed it back to you. I'm tired this morning, too, guys. I'm tired. Uh, my wife and kids are away. Who's that? Is that Rob? My wife and kids. My wife and kids are away. So I'm just there with the dogs. And Randy decided to wake me up at 5 o'clock this morning because he wanted to eat. I think the cat put him up to it. Um, but I made them wait because I don't want to get woken up at 4.30 this morning. But one of the nice things about being home alone just get to cook for yourself a little bit. Take out my uh, my meal right now. Been on that like health plan thing. So just had a perfect man meal. All uh, chicken, all grilled chicken. A little of uh, Hunter at Truck Parking Club's barbecue sauce thrown there. Put in the cast iron skillet. I don't know. Takes less than 10 minutes to make the entire thing. Absolutely delicious. But my decision to do that is backed by science. Check a look at this. Yeah, right there. 88% of Americans are sick, as that says. But only 12% are eating only meat. Do the math there. Where is that 12% of the 88%? Right there for you. By the way, guys, clock, please. Thank you very much. Big story up on FreightWaves.com going on. Our top story today is uh, something we've been thinking about a lot. We've been thinking about the story a ton, and it's why was there that big run-up in rates and everything, that big run-up during the pandemic, and then why did the freight recession happen, and then why has the cycle persisted so long? And there's been a lot of theories, and one of them had to do with all of the money that was poured into the economy during COVID. Obviously, however, no one's really broken down the stats that went into that, exactly how much money was poured into that industry. Well, that's changed today. Go over to FreightWaves.com. You're going to want to read this full entire report. It's, it's pretty long. Long, but I'll give you the TLDR on it and uh, we'll get to it. So you remember all those low interest COVID era loans? In just under two years, the SBA injected approximately 390 billion of inexpensive credit into the economy, bolstering small business balance sheets and, al and allowing them to survive the pandemic. John Paul Hampstead reports, Freightways asked the SBA how much money went to these transportation companies. Well, the answer came back and it's really, really eye-opening. $37 billion was lent to the transportation and warehousing sector. Uh, there was 4,000 419,500 loans for an average loan amount of $88,200. In sector 48 to 49, there are 723,573 total businesses employing 726,238 people. Of those people working in the sector, 539,702 work at forums with only one to four employees. In other words, the majority of the sector is composed of small businesses, and 58% of those received those COVID EIDL loans. A loan of $88,000 would allow an owner operator's earnings have been cut in half from $91,000 to $45,000 to continue to operate for two years without feeling any effects at all. A, um, and you can see that in the capacity here, too. Check, check out capacity chart next. It gives you a good picture of what's been coming in. Yeah, there we go. And as you can see, we've had some bleed out. Yeah, that massive, massive run out. You've had some bleed out. But I think we did the math on that recently, too, and it would be like about six years to get back to baseline of 300 carriers a week falling out of the market. So a long way to go. Freightways Craig Fuller says these loans are insane, up to $2 million and 3.75% interest for 30 years. The catch, though, some of these loans were collateralized against personal real estate, such as homes. While the smallest COVID disaster loans were unsecured, loans above $25,000 re required that collateral, and loans exceeding $200,000 required borrowers to use their primary residence as collateral. New loans stopped being issued two years ago, but payments are now required. Roosters are coming home. As reality catches up with these small carriers, they have to make a profit and pay off the loan or lose their homes. We'll see an acceleration in trucking companies leaving the business. Now, that's also going to have knock-on effects, right? So you have all these trucking companies that might exit the business. These loans come in. Also, you have insurance costs that are going up and the bad market that we're still in, although we've seen a little bit of improvement, but still in a bad market. But the knock-on effects are you look in the used market, right? A lot of these companies are going to have to sell their trucks on. It's going to bring down rates over in the used market. But you look at all the SaaS providers, all the freight tech in the field too. All those different companies that have seats now with a lot of these small companies, they start going out of business. You're going to start seeing a lot of churn 
over in the SaaS portion. Uh, JP Hampstead says, vendors heavily exposed to the small carrier market from factoring companies to software providers may see significant churn in their carrier base. George Otel, he says, last year, we had over 20 funding sources providing SBA working capital for trucking companies. This year, we have only three, and declines have gone through the roof. Andrew Thiel says it's an insane situation. As these bills become due, watch the downstream effects, not only on capacity and trucking, but the economy if the loans start getting called in and collateral foreclosed on. Uh, Neely Taminga from Distill, she says, EIDL loans have been written down twice by the SBA over the past year. 400 billion issued to 4 million for firms, 90% of issuance to firms of less than 10 people, low rate, long terms, and showing early distress. Only one year into repayment, Canary in the coal mine, it's being called. What do y'all make? What do y'all think of this? Tracks to me. Anyways, we are on episode 733 of What the Truck. On the show, I'm joined by Transfix co-founder Drew McElroy. Transfix rode the freight tick rave from the top to the bottom and came out the other side, a different company. We're gonna find out about their big pivot. They sold their brokerage unit to NFI. Now, they're, uh, now we'll find out what they're doing, how they went from this one time near billion dollar company to what they're up to now. Freight tech survival story, perhaps. Um, well, the news may be trying to gaslight you into thinking remote work is dead. Journey's Morgan McDermott is li living the digital nomad's dream. We'll find out how she's managing to get the most out of her career and life while seeing the world. She did some squats up in Alaska for us last week, if you remember. And joining us now, Maca, Maca Logistics' Rob Liss. He talks about intermodal refill moves out of Mexico, maybe some potential disruptions from Burl. And he's got uh, some cool pins, too. We'll get to. But let's tip Town Logistics. And then we'll get to it. Talon Logistics is working with today's most environmentally conscious shippers. The company allows BCOs and freight forwarders to reduce their carbon footprint while achieving cost parity between diesel trucks and zero emission vehicles. Find out more at talonlogisticsinc.com slash sustainability. And right now let's be joined by Rob Liss. He's the vice president over at MACA Logistics. Rob, good to see you. The pins, they came safe and sound. I got one on my shirt right now. I'm holding one up right here. Oh, you got one too? Let's give the people a close up. Yeah, I got a picture of this thing right here. I yeah, dig it, man. We love it. The uh, you know you got a container moving. It's a fifty three foot billboard with your logo on it. So um, anything we can do to kind of hype that up, we're we're trying to do it. So um, we appreciate you wearing the pin, man. I uh, thank you. There's some sort of a social like aspect, social media aspect around these pins. Tell us about that. Yeah, so uh, I was fortunate to to ride on the the train, the CBKC uh, Empress train. So they had an anniversary trip uh, for their one year anniversary, going from Canada all the way down to Mexico City. Um, on there in Mexico, we saw a bunch of just rail fans, people that got up at six in the morning, uh, seven a.m. while it's still dark outside, just taking pictures of that steam engine as it's going through. And there's really a, a huge community of, of train spotters, people that kind of track the trains. Um, and we really wanted to tap into that. I mean, we only got a, a small amount of boxes out in the wild, but um, people that are rail fans, we, we'd love to be a part of that culture as much as we can be. Uh, so if you're out there, you're taking photos of trains anyway, uh, you see one of our boxes out there, we would love to recognize you for that and, and try to kind of glom on to um, uh, what hobbyists are already doing. Uh, it's, it's really unique. And, and I think one thing that's really special about moving rail is how much everyone loves railroads that work there. So you, you really have to, to love intermodal, love railroading uh, to make things work. And it really makes the process much better and smoother from a, a customer perspective when the people that you're working with are really invested in what they're doing. I could agree with you more. And now people, they're going to, if they're looking out for these boxes, they're going to see some of them going all the way from Mexico and Canada. And I want to talk about that lane in that road because I know you've been doing some great work there. But I got an interesting DM this morning from a shipper out in Houston, a toy shipper. And he was talking about uh, a truck he was supposed to have come in. Hurricane comes, got held. Now he's got to pay. Well, the company wants him to pay seven fifty for the truck plus the two, three days Amazon wouldn't deliver. Typical sort of hurricane headaches, hurricane nightmares that sort of happen. And Mac is seeing anything, any fallout from barrels so far? I mean, there's going to be disruptions at the local terminal. Same with people that are living there. It's hard to get to the roads. It's hard to get those trucks into the actual terminal to, to pull the boxes out. Um, but you look at railroads, they're, they're really resilient. Um, if you look at uh, Ukraine, for example, there's a bunch of stories at the start of the war that the one thing the Russians couldn't shut down was the trains running in the Ukraine. Uh, so it's it's something where railroads are really resistant. If there is natural disasters, there, there's a lot of pieces you can kind of come in to, to restore those lanes very quickly. Uh, 
um, you know, there's a lot of infrastructure there. There's a lot of improvement that's constantly happening, um, you know, along those rail lines. Uh, so unlike uh, a road where it's publicly funded and you're really reliant on the government to fix an issue, it's all privately funded for the rail. So if there is an issue, there's not a delay, there's not a bureaucracy going into it. It's that railroad going straight to fixing that issue and getting the things moving as fast as possible. Uh, so it's certainly not immune to disruptions, but it is uh, much more equipped to kind of handle that uh, as opposed to a uh, a public uh, entity. Um, so if there are disruptions, they should be smaller in scale, um, you know, for larger periods. Interesting. So what's good in Mexico with with rail now? I know you're doing some bonded reefers out of there. Talk a little bit about how this lane got established and what you're all doing there. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we do have two major lanes that we're, we're doing now. Um, the majority of our freight is moving from San Luis Potosi, um, that's the Interpuerto ramp, up to Wiley, Texas, and Dallas. Uh, so that's a, a four-day transit um, that's, that's going up there, four days once it's on the rail. Uh, the nice part about moving intermodal is that it's actually a simpler process than going over the road uh, when you're crossing uh, through Mexico. So it's a private rail crossing in Laredo. The railroad owns it. Um, they have traffic going both ways on the train, first come, first serve. Uh, so it's northbound train, southbound train, northbound train, southbound train. Uh, it's, it's very fast once the, the box clears customs before it loads. So once that box clears, it clears in and a Puerto and not a Laredo and the train doesn't have to stop. It just goes continuously, um, just waiting for a signal clearance and they're actually doubling that capacity. So there'd be traffic going both ways with a second bridge, uh, by the end of the year. Uh, going into Canada, that's actually business that comes to us through uh, our partner, Armstrong Transport Group. It's actually a, a company that's based in Chattanooga. So 1010 Transport, Todd Harper, he's, he's out there in Chattanooga. It's his customer. Uh, so it's something where he came to us as part of Armstrong and, hey, I've got a customer that moves freight um, between Mexico and Canada. We're moving it over the road. We'd like to move it intermodal because of the um, carbon savings. The, it's environmentally friendly. It's important for their customer. Uh, also business from uh, Mexico into New Jersey. So we're actually able to move those in bond, um, pick it up in Mexico, move it refrigerated um, up to Toronto. Uh, and that's about an eight or nine day transit. Uh, so it's comparable to over the road, um, especially because that clearance piece is so much quicker. So instead of having a box, maybe waiting at the border for one to three days on average, sometimes four to five, as soon as it clears customs, the train doesn't stop. So it's very it's very efficient in terms of, of going there. So we're really excited to be part of, you know, a partner with the CBKC for that that lane going into Canada. It's something that's really unique that that we do that we're proud to be a part of. Um, but also we're able to service the east and west coast on the CSX. That's what we do for New Jersey and uh, with the BNSF contract to service the west coast locations as well. You know, with that, with the, the rail merger that happened, right? It, did that cause? Has that changed anything? Has that changed any process or anything? Yeah, so it's it's totally a new process. It's it's a unique service. So there's two railroads in Mexico. There's the CPKC, which is what what we're on, and the Ferromex. Uh, the Ferromex is entirely within Mexico. So uh, when it gets the border, it has to get off a Ferromex train, transfer over to either BNSF or, or UP, uh, whereas the CPKC goes straight through. So you have one continuous line that goes all the way from Mexico City up through uh, Kansas City, through Chicago, and then around to both Vancouver and uh, Montreal. So you've got coast to coast uh, in Canada and north and south all the way through. It's the only transnational railroad. Uh, so that's one of the things that they were celebrating earlier this year with that steam engine they restored uh, to run down. This is the first time that you've really connected three continents. So you look at the um, USMCA and, and the you know, agreements that came in from trade, that's really going to be, I, I think, a big backbone of, of future growth. Uh, right now, Intermodal is a very small share of cross-border freight um, from Mexico, and that's only going to grow as capacity comes in because you're using a Mexican carrier in Mexico. You're using the same driver, the same thing, and, and really your, your risk bucket in Mexico, instead of going from the length all the way to the border, it's just the few hundred miles you know, to the ramp. Uh, so it's it's a very secure process. It's very smooth, and there's a lot of capacity that you're able to bring to it. Um, you know, for most uh, trucking companies that are going between Mexico and the U.S., they've got a ratio of about one truck to every or three trailers for every one truck. Uh, with us, because we're able to utilize rail equipment, other people's boxes, in addition to our own, um, we don't have to have that same ratio. So it's it's really efficient in terms of a, a an asset capacity, you know, uh, utilization. Uh, so it's it's something that we're we're really excited about, and we're going to see 
more and more freight move intermodal because it's it's safer it's just as fast as truckload if not faster because you avoid those bottlenecks at the border uh, and it's something that's environmentally friendly so it, it really checks a lot of boxes in terms of what you're looking for in growth uh, a, a five ten year even one year horizon it's it's uh, something that we're, we're tremendously excited about and, and feel very fortunate to be um, you know part of with with our equipment and with our partners um, at the CPKC and, and CSX and BNSF Ah, very, very cool. And, you know, you mentioned cargo security, and it's such a big issue, especially in the United States right now, in the lower 48 with so much freight fraud and theft and all that's going on. When you when you mentioned the rail is safe, are you seeing like less pilferage there than like truck hijackings or whatever may be going down in Mexico? It's, it's less than less than one percent. So okay. um, and that's on the, the CPKC line. So it's, it's really uh, um, it was really cool for me to be uh, able to ride the train on that Empress line from Laredo um, South. And so when you're on there, they actually confined everybody to the last car on the train as it went through, because there's a, a gamma ray that goes through and examines every piece of cargo as it covers. Um, meanwhile, well, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but you, you pick up in Mexico, um, you've got that few hundred miles between the origin and the ramp. And that's really where your risk bucket is for something to happen on the road. That's an uncontrolled environment. It, it's the same as as moving any other kind of shipment in Mexico. But once you're on the train, you're in a secure facility. The CBKC has 1,100 um, of their own employee or er, their own police force in Mexico own security forces. Um, once the box is on the train, um, it doesn't stop. It's in a well car. It's got four feet of steel all around it, or it's 15 feet in the air on top of another box. So it's really secure once it's going. And the big security part of it is making sure that train doesn't stop. So one that improves speed, but also that improves safety. It's really hard to hop on a moving train. It's really hard to rob a train. Um, you know, it's something where, you know, it's, it's, if you have, uh, compared to hijacking a truck versus hijacking a train, it's, it's just a different, um, you know, one only happens in movies, right? So the, uh, it's something that's, it's secure in terms of pickup, it's secure in terms of once in transit. And the fastest thing is that it doesn't have that bottleneck at the border. So if a trailer's sitting for one to three days, um, well, that driver isn't going to sit with that trailer necessarily, that kind of introduces an area for or something bad to happen where a driver's maybe not necessarily with that equipment. Um, it's in a yard somewhere. Um, having the boxes move faster, having them move continuously, that's really the key to security. So just running a fast operation, running an efficient operation is also a safe operation. Um, so I think it's, it's kind of an old, old adage in freight, but, um, you know, a really simple supply chain is a really efficient supply chain. Uh, and compared to using a cross border carrier and, and drain across the border and all the different pieces and transloading things that could happen. Um, it's a much simpler process. It's a much more efficient process. Are, are you a railhead? You, do you have like a favorite train? <laughs> well, I, I got to ride the Empress. So that was my, that's my favorite train now, but I, uh, I'm really excited. What was the road? Where did, where'd you go? Uh, yeah, so we went from Laredo to Monterey. So it's wow. it's uh, um, it's a you know it's a three hour drive or a, a nine hour train ride because you, you you're going slow because there's people stopping taking photos. It was really really special experience to be a part of that. Um, but there's if you get the chance to to ride these these commercial trains, it's really um, really fun. So I'm excited for uh, uh, Morgan, one of your your guests today. So my, my sister lives in Alaska. She lives on the Kenai Peninsula, and last time I went to visit her. There's an Alaskan rail route that runs from Anchorage to Seward, and you can ride that. They've got this glass observation car. It's it's absolutely gorgeous. You're going through uh, the mountains, and you can see bald eagles and bears and moose. It's 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 really amazing. So um, I'm a big rail enthusiast, and, and and I think that's kind of important. If you're if you're selling something, you got to love it and know it and 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 know the limitations of it from a, a, a free perspective, but also the benefits of it. But it's something too that I think uh, you know rail travel is something that if you have the opportunity to take a nice train to to have that experience, it, it's an amazing place, this amazing way to see sections of the country that you wouldn't see otherwise. So um, the uh, I think there's a, a a Santa Claus North Pole train in Chattanooga that I hear is pretty nice that the, the Norfolk Southern runs. So we yeah um, we keep like we have a fixture a fixture of the city is a lot of our we keep a lot of train tracks still here you know not aren't running anymore but they're they're all over the place and of course the choo-choo right down the street from me rob thank you so much uh before i let you go people want to get one of these pins what do they got to do one more time to get one of these and show the big show the big mac a pin please yeah how do they get one of these yeah, yeah so four-step process is is you know step one is is take a picture of a box um you know uh post it on social media send me a, a direct message with your address and I'll, I'll mail you a pin so it's something that we're really excited about our equipment going out there 
Um, you know, to my knowledge, we're the only refill provider out of Mexico on rail right now. Um, so it's something that we've only got a few boxes. We've got 20 boxes that are in service. They're going all across North America. If you want to take a picture of it, it's they're hard to take a photo of because there's not a whole lot of them out there. Um, but if you're a railhead and, and you want to see it, send me a message. I'll send you a GPS tracking link. You can watch our actual box as it moves in real time. And as it gets to closer to you, you can see where you can take a picture of it as it goes through. Uh, so. You know, I really appreciate the uh, the opportunity to get on with you, Dooner, and and uh, thanks so much for for the time and the opportunity to kind of talk about our, our business. Rob, thank you so much for stopping by. Everybody, go snap a picture of a Mac Trail. Go get yourself a pin. Thank you very much, Rob. Thanks for stopping by today. All right, thank you. Take it easy. All right. Meanwhile, let's see what's happening in the rest of the world. Talk about cargo theft getting bad. It's getting so bad. They're just going straight to the mail truck now. So you can see here, too, like, this is like the worst operation. First of all, why was the guy driving? Why is he the one who got out to get the bucket? Why didn't the passengers get the bucket? And then he hands it off to his friend, and they dropped every single letter on the ground. Like, what did they maybe get in there? Some gift cards, birthday cards, a lot of bills? That's a, that's a felony, too. You're going to have the, the postal inspector coming after you. Mike says, Big Mike says, uh, they're about to learn the scariest law enforcement officer in the federal government is the postal inspector. As soon as the post office gets involved, you are hit with massive sentence enhancements. I hope it was worth that. I hope that Applebee's gift card was worth it, boys. All right. Hey, by the way, let's say you stole a gift card. You get 30 bucks. Go to WTTgear.com. Go get yourself our USA shirt. It's up there right now. Beautiful. Soft as cotton around. What is it? Bella. Bella and Canvas. That's the name of the company. They make fantastic shirts. I love them. Go get yourself one. WTTgear.com or scan that QR code. But right now, we got to catch up with Morgan McDermott. She's a senior recruiter advisor at Journey and a digital nomad living the life up in Alaska. By the way, Morgan, did you hear Rob's suggestion about the railroad? Yes, it's so cool. I am very interested in riding that for sure. Yeah, so you haven't been on it yet? No, I have not. You've been, but how long have, so for people who don't know, Morgan McDermott, she was actually out here in Chattanooga for a little bit. She worked across the street from us. She's actually, this isn't even your first time on the show. You were in studio about two or three years ago with Malcolm. I remember we were talking about recruiting and logistics, much crazier market at that time. Now you're with my buddy, Will Jenkins. You were at Journey, but you're not in office anymore. You're all over the world. And right now you're in Alaska. How are you making this work? Well, honestly, it's pretty simple. I have a laptop. I have a portable screen. I have a Wi-Fi generator that I take with me that maybe is not working very well right now. <laughs> but and once you have the housing, you can go anywhere. As long as you take care of all the essentials to work yourself, it's really not as hard as you think. Is, is, there's a, is that the cabin you're in right now, the one that you were mentioning on LinkedIn that has, uh, it doesn't have a bathroom inside, right? It's a dry cabin, I think they call it. Dry cabin, no running water. Yes, I am actually sitting inside that as we speak. Oh, interesting. It doesn't look like it doesn't look as rustic inside as like the outside picture made it seem. No, it's honestly really nice. It has hardwood floors. It has like a nice fresh coat of paint. I mean, it's really comfortable as long as you're okay with not washing your hands. Interesting. Now, so how long have you been out in Alaska now? I got here in early June. So I'm just finished my first month. Interesting. Now, have you encountered like moose, bears, uh, scary people, men with harpoons? Well, actually, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So the moose here are like a deer anywhere else. You see them on the roads. They cross the roads. There's signs everywhere saying, watch out for moose. And I've seen several bears as well. The key to bears, honestly, is to make noise. As long as you have a bear bell, you sound like an idiot, but it keeps you safe. And I do always have bear spray on me as well when I'm hiking. Yeah, because I was like in Gatlinburg, right? And there's there's all sorts of bears over there. And I'm just walking my dog and I'm like nervous as hell. And I'm like, Morgan is so much braver than me just walking around Alaska with like moose and and bears and like any, like I watch a lot of serial killer shows, like any number of crazy transit. Like you don't even care. Is everything cool? Is everything safe out there? What do you have to say to like girls out there who might be thinking about becoming digital nomads? I say do it. I mean, you, you take the same safety precautions you take anywhere else. You know, you'd be smart about things. If you're hiking, you let people know where you are. You bring the proper gear. Um, you don't put yourself in dangerous situations, but it's very easy to be safe. And life is too short to sit inside your house. Now, is it hard to work with like, is it light all day there? Is it dark? Like what part of the season are you in Alaska? I will say that it's not light all day, but it is light for the entire time I am awake. So I get up around 5.30. It is light out. 
I usually am asleep by 11, 11.30. It is light out. So I'm assuming sometime in that 11.30 to 5.30 a.m. window, it gets dark, but I have yet to see it. Yet to see it. Well, you're getting your sleep in. It's, it's kind of, when you're in those rustic places too, it's like I stayed in uh, the rainforest once in Costa Rica for like four or five days and uh, there's no power. And you just sleep, you kind of just, well, for you, you can't just sleep with the sun. We would just sleep with the sun out there and you'd be up at like five in the morning because that's when the howler monkeys got up and you'd, you know, go to sleep when you, when you got tired. Now, any issues, like for people who want to like transition to working, digital nomad, because you know, a lot of the news media kept saying it's dead, everyone has to go back to the office and everything. You're still out here making it work. How can other people in supply chain kind of live this lifestyle that you're doing? You have to find the right opportunity for sure. And then you have to remember to actually work. I lead a very disciplined life. I log in every day by 6 a.m. I work straight through until 2. I follow central hours since we're a Chicago-based company. But you have to remember that you still have a job to do, despite how beautiful everything around you is or how many different hiking trails there might be. You still have to work. As far as finding remote roles, they do exist. There are a lot of freight brokerages that hire remote employees. The steamship lines hire remote employees. Some shippers do. The key to landing one of those opportunities, as brutal as this sounds, is make sure that you are qualified for it. I see a lot of people who want to do a remote role, but maybe their required experience is something they don't have. Or maybe their tenure at their previous role was just too short. For me, I worked in an office for almost three years before I got my remote role, and I traveled that as well. If you can't find a remote job, use your PTO to your advantage. Go places, take vacations. Um, and working with recruiters, as crazy as, as it sounds, can actually help you find remote roles as well because we have access to a lot of different opportunities. Do you feel like you have to work a little bit harder, though? Because is there always sort of like that stigma when you're out like, oh, uh, well, oh, Morgan's not answering Slack. She's off like fishing in Alaska again, or she's in Italy drinking wine at, at a chateau. Like, w do you have to worry about that at all? Yes, I think especially with social media and when you're posting all these beautiful photos, there's this idea that you're just constantly doing fun things. Yeah. And the reality is, is I do fun things on the weekends. I hike Friday nights. I hike all day Saturday and all day Sunday. But you know I say Monday that because I, Friday Morgan, morning, I, I am Morgan, I say that because I've worked on the operations side in this business. And if you like called in, if you just called in sick, like you called in sick on like a Tuesday and you showed up on people would just glare at you. Like people would just, you know, that like that past mm -hmm. day, all they were doing was talking crap about you. And then you get in there, class, like, sorry, man. Maybe it's different after the COVID era. But like back in the day, people were like super strict and you would get so much heat just for being out one damn day. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, you know what's cool? Though? That's you, our industry, out. too. I know it's our industry is, is brutal like that, but you're out there and you're not only like doing your recruiting, you're not only seeing Alaska, but you're going viral on LinkedIn. You had this one post here. It got 36,376 likes, probably more since I screenshot of this just a second ago. Show that post. What's up, guys? No. I'm Morgan. <laughs> well, we can look at your squats. I am coming at you live from Alaska. <laughs> and I am here today to do Alaska's 10 air squats. Let's go. <laughs> cool. So many. You did an awesome job and you had the best backdrop, but we can drop that. Let's get over to the LinkedIn post, please. Let's get over to LinkedIn post. Tell me a little bit about this post. Why do you think this went so viral? What, what nerve did you hit here? You know, I think that I offended a lot of people. Um, I made two crucial mistakes with that post. I did not say that I work on specialized roles. I only work on supply chain logistics roles. That's my specialty. That's my niche. And so this reads as something that's general advice, which to me, I do think is pretty general advice, but it's also, I, I should have clarified that this is, I only work on supply chain. Um, as far as that, I think that my, it was very, a very cheeky post. You know, I threw a little bit of humor in there. And I think for job seekers who are feeling the burnout and feeling the exhaustion of applying to hundreds of jobs and not getting answers and seeing conflicting advice everywhere, I think it just was poorly done. And it wasn't intended to do that. But if you read through the comments, um, for every person who found the advice valuable, there was at least two or three more who found it very offensive. 
Uh, it's tough. It's tough being out there in social media and putting yourself on the, especially when something just like, because you post a million things like this, right? And like, you know, it's like if it does well, it's like a hundred likes or something. And it's like, oh, it's a few thousand people saw it really good. Got some comments. Like going 36,000 is crazy because you get into like the general population of LinkedIn. People have no idea like who you are or what industry. They have no context whatsoever for who you, so you start getting tons of, but all you said here is like, some people aren't including contact information. Their resumes aren't up to date. They title them all resume 2024. So it's impossible possible to find them when you save them. These are all pretty smart things. But what is, okay, before we let you go, what is your top tip for people looking for jobs? And some people might get offended. Let's put a disclaimer. Well, what's your top tip to not F up your resume? Don't get mad. She's trying to get you hired. I'm trying to help. Um, top tip is going to be making it super clear, super straightforward, easy to read, and please, please save it with your name. That makes it so much easier for any hiring manager to find and access and send forward. Um, yeah, clear, straight, easy information, contact information. Save it with your name. Well, Morgan, you are living the dream over in Alaska. I know you're there for a few more months. Uh, people want great recruiting advice. If they want to see the beautiful scenery of Alaska, what's the best way to follow you over on LinkedIn? LinkedIn? LinkedIn is the only social media I use. LinkedIn's the only one. Well, you're doing a great job on there, so I don't blame you, Morgan. Thank you so much for stopping by the show today. Um, I, you're one of my heroes. I, I love seeing you out there going crazy in Alaska. By the way, do you have your next location picked out? I do. I've actually been invited to go to Granada in the Caribbean in November. So uh, from Alaska, I'm going to head that way, actually. Uh, very. Do you, do you even have like a real home now or no? No. I have a storage unit storage okay well you, where's that located is that chattanooga chattanooga <laughs> all right we're claiming you then she's from chattanooga thank you morgan thank you so much have an awesome week stay safe out there too thank you carry that bear i will we'll talk soon she said she had a bell i think a bear bell gotta, gotta find out about those uh anyways uh tell them there we go tell logistics working with today's most environmentally conscious shippers the company allows bcos and freight forwarders to reduce their carbon footprint while achieving cost parity between diesel trucks and zero emission vehicles find out more at town logistics inc slash sustainability by the way we saw morgan squats but look what some other drivers are doing now they're doing push-ups so we had everyone doing 10 air squats across america we got all 50 states thank you all so much we got all 50 states we got about eight countries as well people doing air squats well this guy right here as uh, this guy right here is SoCal Driver 848. He's doing 20 push ups at every single pickup location. Now, we started out talking about those SBA loans and how they've helped keep the freight market depressed by keeping uh, companies in business. What do you think would happen to capacity if we made every truck driver have to do 20 push ups at every single pickup? Rates would be like, what, how much? Nine bucks? 12 bucks? We're talking about Morgan offending people. There's drivers right now probably giving their. Thing the finger. All right. Anyways, before I get into any more trouble, let's talk to Drew McElroy, co-founder at Transfix. Drew, it's uh, it's great to see you. And like, man, I talk so much on here about the wildness of the market in both like the freight market and freight tech. And nobody really has a story quite like the Transfix story and what you've gone through in this just crazy wave of the past few years. Oh, hold on. We got you muted. Did we get him unmuted? Try one more hey, time, Drew. Can you hear me? Yeah, we got you now. You're good. You're good now. Hey, dude. What's going on, man? Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, definitely never a dull moment, man. We've had a, <laughs> we've all had quite a journey. I'm I'm very jealous of your last guest uh, from from Alaska to Granada. That's that's quite a that's quite a digital journey. It's it's quite a jump. It's quite a jump. And I bet, like you know, the one nice thing about being so far and remote is you can just like silence this close the computer and no one can get you no no one's close <laughs> enough to get at you but hey you've so well her one tip was make sure you keep working so i don't know if that's such a good plan but you know <laughs> that's, true. that's true that's true you want to take in some of the you know, i hope she goes on that railroad too that uh rob was talking about before her but let's talk about transfix for a second you've recently done a pivot but leading up to that um had a big run through 2020, 2021, we're raising money, almost IPO'd. You guys changed decision on that. 2023 is a big year for decision change, uh, changing. This year, you sold the brokerage unit to NF at NFI, and now Transfix is, is a different company. Tell, tell me about this story. What happened? Yeah, it's it's a it's really it's really been exciting, man. Um, it's funny you said the word pivot. I've been using the word uh, reimagined uh, yeah. because the truth is the the mission. And the, the purpose of Transfix has not changed from the very beginning, which is to say the same thing we've always been saying, that 
uh, trucking and truckload freight specifically in the U.S. is quite wasteful and quite frustrating for everybody involved. And technology can really help with that. Um, so our, our perspective on, on how the world looks hasn't changed. Uh, what has changed is our business model. And so, as you mentioned, we have sold our, our brokerage unit uh, and we have now uh, launched the platform that we built to run that brokerage unit as a series of standalone SaaS modules available to the broker and shipper community to help drive efficiency throughout their businesses. So, like I said, the, the mission remains the same, but rather than delivering services directly to shippers, we are now delivering that software to what should be a much larger audience. Why move out of the, the the brokerage side? Why move out of digital freight, though? There was so much sort of promise there. But then, of course, 2023 happened. We saw stories like convoys, of course. Um, we see the change here. It, look, I'm right. I'm right in the middle of it. I, I work with a uh, VC back company like Freightways. I mean, we felt the pivots and we felt everything. So I, I'm sitting next to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that any startup that is not yet profitable uh, the founders, the leadership, it's incumbent upon us to always be considering the future and, and what is the best uh, sort of path to the top of the mountain, right? You have a vision, but then the way you get there, you know, is, is open for debate, right? And so we founded Transfix during a time where obviously not only were the, the freight markets robust, but I think more relevant to our story was the capital markets were obviously much different as well. It was a time when interest rates were very low. And ultimately, access to capital was was quite plentiful. And the primary metric of success in many of these communities was growth. You'll get to profitability eventually, grow, 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 profit later. And frankly, the uh, the interests of that capital have, have evolved over time. And so as we thought about our own future, part of it was reflective of that reality, right? You have to be good stewards of capital for your for your partners. But frankly, also the, 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 the real main driver um, and the reason we ultimately pulled the trigger on this was because the frankly, the opportunity um, is, I think, bigger and, and certainly more easy to access from a capital efficiency perspective, which is to say we've spent all of this time building what we genuinely believe and are, are very happy to show off to be the best technological platform, the best software to actually execute truckloads that exists. And that is the core value that we bring to the table. And frankly, in running a brokerage, there were many things that were drains on our resource and time that had nothing to do with the core value we were creating, right? Things like AP and AR and claims and insurance. And these things were not we were not reinventing the wheel there, but they were taking a lot of our time. And so ultimately, when you know, we, when we had the opportunity to move on from the brokerage in a way that was um, quite successful for us and for for you know the acquirer, et cetera, et cetera, and allow us to focus on the software that is the real driver of our value. Uh, frankly, it became um, a pretty uh, easy decision with all candor, um, because again, our goal has always been how do we move the most freight through the pipes, right? Through the software pipes that we have built that drive efficiency. That's the primary goal. And it seems now that that platform exists, it's much easier to drive revenue onto it via uh, via partnership and, and via the software than, than trying to add one shipper at a time with all the things that go along with that. Is it, what kind of, and when we talk software too, such a broad term, what, what are your, what's the focus now? What is Transfix sort of doing? What's the, what's, you said the mission didn't change, just the approach to the mission changed. So what's the approach? What do you offer? That's right. That's right. So we have a, a full set of modules uh, that, that really can impact the efficacy with which either brokers or shippers execute truckload. And like the best way to think about it is literally throughout each step, of the life cycle of a load. So we have tools that will help with everything from RFP management to spot pricing to appointment making, even things that sound slightly more basic on the front end, like you know algorithmic decision making about a tender acceptance and things like that. The entire, every single module, which there'll be more announcements in the coming days, but there are, as you can imagine, we've, we've built a pretty robust platform here. Every single module 
maps directly to the P&L of a broker. So it's either how do we help you reduce variable cost on a per load basis so that you keep more of the gross margin that you generate in the load, or how do we help you expand that gross margin, either through bidding on more loads, making sure that you're bidding the right price, or making sure that you're you're paying the right price to the carrier. So every tool maps directly back to the P&L because that's how we built it. We built it alongside the brokerage. We know probably better than any software company out there what it's like to be a broker, where the pain points exist, and we can literally point. There's anecdotes about every module, why it exists. Oh, this shipper was doing this, and so we built this to make it better. Uh, and we can do that throughout the life cycle of a load. So it becomes like, where, where can we help? what you're using today, right? It doesn't, it's not necessarily a rip and replace, take, you know, uh, take your TMS and use the Transfix platform. It's more, where are you either experiencing high variable costs or where are you missing opportunities? And we, we have tools to help fill those gaps. And, you know, some people can look at these kind of, these kind of reimaginings as negative, but you don't really sound negative at all. You, you, Making a shift and understanding when you have to make a change, I think, is a survival story. It's something that at times you can be proud of and not see as a failure. Transfix is still here. You guys are still going. Dude, I, I mean, obviously, I would say this. I'm on your show. But I swear to God, man, I am so pumped. Uh, it is um, – Transfix has always had very big ambitions, and, and we continue to do so. And we continue to see sort of the delight – and the value that we can create in people we work with, whether they be broker partners, shipper partners, carrier partners, that's all been part of the story. The biggest thing I feel now uh, on the other side of this transaction is the ability to go so much faster. Um, We all know that adding shippers is a complex endeavor and it takes time and you have to get it right and you have to go one at a time. And we did that for a long time. uh, And I think we did it very well. But it was always in service of meeting this larger mission of how do we drive the efficiency of moving freight. And it's partially about efficiency within the, you know, within our own business, but it's also within our partner's business. And the reality is software is a wonderful business model to be in, uh, in terms of running the business, right? Brokerage is very, very hard. We all know that. And these days, our mission is much cleaner. We have software, we have engineers, we have product, and we have partners that we enable to be the best they can be, right? And and the more we can um, spread the pipes through so that more and increasingly larger amounts of freight move through it, the more value we we will create industry-wide. And that has always been our goal. So we've, not only are we here, we've, we believe found a way to increase the velocity at which our tools are adopted by the market, which has always been our goal. And, and it's admittedly a somewhat circuitous path we took to get here, but I actually view that as part of our uniqueness. Again, we built all of these tools alongside the brokerage. We know exactly where the pain points are. Uh, you know, I mean, and even in talking with NFI, right? It's like, oh, well, you know, here's why this happened, right? And you, you see these meetings of the minds, right? And so these, these conversations, you know, for a freight dork like me, it's a lot of fun, man. It's like, no, this is how we can help, right? And it's we've gone from being, you know, competitors with some of these folks to now there's no more competition in that sense, right? Like we're here to enable you and make you be or help you be the best that you can be. And that's a it's a really fun thing to do. Every day it's like, oh, what are we gonna do now? And it's uh I'm really having a good time, man. Yeah, no, I mean I hear it. I, I listen to a lot of people and I hear it, and that's why I kinda asked that question. I'm like, you sound you sound like you're on the right path. You sound like you're, you're, you've got like a new, you got your second or third or you're a founder. So you probably are on like your 19th wind by now, but you sounded like you got another wind in your sails going on. Anybody who follow- knows me would tell you I'm full of hot air. That's for sure. So that's, <laughs> that's not a surprise. Well, hey, people who want some of your hot air, they want some of the gas Transfix is offering. Where do I send them to if they want to check out what's new at Transfix? And I, I they should. It's a there's yeah, a lot man, of new come, stuff going on. Come, come talk to us, right? Our, our website is transfix.io, and we're active on on socials. Our primary one is LinkedIn, but you can find us, uh, you know, with a simple Google search. And you know, as as you can imagine, we are looking to have conversations with everybody out there that's moving freight. And looking to be the you know the best and most efficient at it they can be. We have we have tools that will help you and, and tools that will pay for themselves from day one. So if that sounds even remotely interesting, please come find us and let's let's have a conversation about it. 
Well, hey, Drew, good luck with everything. Thank you so much for stopping by the show. And thank you for sharing a story. Not easy for everyone to do. And I appreciate your candor today. Dinner. It's a pleasure, man. You be well. Hey, take care. All right, everybody. Hey, we'll be back uh, Friday. Thanks for joining us today. If you're on the live stream on FreightWaves.com or FreightWaves social media, if you're listening on demand, wherever you get podcasts by looking up What the Truck, if you're on FreightWaves YouTube channel where the entire What the Truck playlist is, or if you're listening on SiriusXM's Road Dog Trucking at 5 and 11 p.m. Eastern on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, thanks for stopping by. Coming Friday, we got Matthew Leffler, the armchair attorney, talking about that Chevron ruling, Anthony Slamar, and he's back, Justin Martin, super trucker. Stop by the show. Say hello. Find me on Twitter at Timothy Dooner. Find the show at FW at the Truck. Take care and don't be.